Hello, Carm Capriato here, and welcome to Town Hall Academy, episode 104. Are you struggling to get things done? Are you a non-starter? Is it possible that there's a reason you don't implement? Well, I've assembled the Business Coaches Lab to crack this topic wide open. This problem affects most all of us. Now, here's a taste. There's only two times in your day that you can completely control, and that is the beginning of your day and the end of your day. And I think it's really important to start our days with intention. Welcome automotive aftermarketers to a Remarkable Results Radio Town Hall Academy. Listen to learn just one thing from today's episode on your journey to remarkable results. Hello, Carm Capriato here with the repurposed podcast of our live Town Hall Academy on the art of implementation, how to get things done. The business coaches are here, and we're going to get into the weeds of implementation and help you realize why you get stuck doing the very important tasks or projects that will move your business forward. Hey, I want to thank my sponsors for making the Town Hall Academy free for all aftermarketers. Now, here's another reason to choose Jasper. It's their commitment to continuous improvement. Their investment in research and development, product updates, and remanufacturing processes means Jasper provides the perfect product. Go to jasperengines.com for the entire Jasper story. Here's some great information from RepairPal. Did you know that 2,200 shops get an average of 8 to 12 new customer calls from RepairPal every month? There's no long-term contracts, and referrals from partners like CarMax and USAA add even more value to their program. Go to RepairPal.com slash shops for more information. Hey, a quick note on two really important pages on my website. The books page, where the books you hear about in this episode and every book we discuss on the over 500 combined episodes are listed there. You can even order the books in paper or audio by clicking through to Amazon. It's nice and convenient. Now, also, the AMI page offers you elective credit as you work to earn your AAM or AMAM certifications. Select podcasts listed there can earn you credit. Now, check it out. Okay, let's talk getting things done, the art of implementation. In this continuing series of the Business Coaches Lab, we work to help you get into gear. The coaches mostly agree that there's a few problems for inaction. The discussion includes finding your momentum, your one thing, planning, reflecting, and the fact that you're probably trying to do too much because you wear too many hats. So if you want to be a better leader, CEO, and all-around good person, you need to give these coaches a listen. A huge amount of free advice awaits you. I'm joined by Rick White from 180Biz, Cecil Bullard with the Institute for Automotive Business Excellence, Jude Larson from the ACT Group, and Murray Voth from RPM Training. Key talking points already written for you that will give you a bulleted plan for improvement. Also find my guests' bios, links to their coaching companies, and links to their previous episodes at remarkableresults.biz a A104. Now, let's go get something done. Wow, the art, (laughs) the art of implementation. Guilty as charged. And you know what? I have worked so hard in my life to try to get things done, to, you know, come up with a list, to come up with certain disciplines. And, and, you know, Jude, I got to, I got to thank you for bringing me my first, our first talking point here. It was a bunch of years ago that somebody that I worked for came up to me and says, have you ever seen the movie City Slickers? (laughs) And I said, (laughs) yes. And he says, do you remember Jack Palance? And I said, sure. And he says, what was his big shtick in the movie, right? Just one thing. Now, how does that relate, Jude, to the art of implementation? Well, of course, in, in the movie, it's a very dramatic, you know, moment when he's talking with Billy Crystal and, um, you know, Billy Crystal, of course, is very scared of his character, and it's it's quite comical when he sits down next to him, and and then after they share a moment, uh, he does you know the infamous one finger, and he tells him, you know, this is what life is all about, is this, and then he asks him, well, what's this, and he says, that's what you have to figure out, and so when it comes to implementation, the reason I think of that is because so often we'll go to a seminar class, a training something, listen to a webinar, uh, you know, whatever it is. And I mean, I know I come out and I'm, I know all these guys do too. It's just, you know, pages of notes that you're just like, oh man, that's a great idea. That's another great idea. And you have this whole list. 
And then you go back to the business the next day or the, you know, next week or whatever. And, and the phones are ringing and people are on fire running through the shop and, you know, all that kind of stuff that's going on. And you pick up that big list and you're just like, Oh man, I don't even know where to start. Um, so what works best is to pick one thing. You go down the list and you find what's the, what's the biggest impact. Like if I did this one thing, that would have the biggest impact on the business today if I got that done. Um, and it could be even the way you look at, at your list every morning of what you need to get done. Because oftentimes what we'll do instead, if we're going to be honest, right, is we put that one thing off because it's hard or we mm. don't like doing it. It's not fun. So we're like, well, let me knock out these other six things first. Then I'll feel really accomplished. And then I'll go back and I'll tackle that one thing. Next thing you know, it's 530 and the one thing never got touched. <laughs> and so the business just continues to, you know, cycle on as it does. Every once in a while, Jude, don't we pick a one thing that we know we have to get done, but it's just not, not our favorite thing to do? Well, for smart, we do, because it, it, usually the one thing won't be our favorite thing. That's why it's the one thing. There you go. That's a really good point. Uh, there's some research on on that idea of setting yourself up for the beginning of your day and for your week with uh, knocking off a couple of easy things. Not do all your easy things first thing. So I think a balance between the two things you're talking about, Jude, I think it's a huge priority what you talked about. But if we can knock off one or two easy things, our brains reward us, reward us for getting that done. And I think what we need to do is then jump into that one thing at that point. Don't leave it till the end, right? Just do a couple easy ones and then jump right in. It kind of sets your brain up to keep going. That's why they, 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 there's a video out there about the admiral that had the, the, the graduation speech, and he talks about making your bed. Right. And, and then, you know, the fact <laughs> yeah. that making the bed is a sense of accomplishment. And there's a really good book out called Eat That Frog by Brian Tracy, which is just fantastic. Right. You know, Mark yeah. Twain once said, if you got to eat frogs in the morning, pick the biggest, baddest one first. Right. <laughs> so it, the rest are really easy after that. Good. What was yeah. that? I said the rest are easy after you eat that big, bad one. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, for I, sure. I think sometimes it's, it, it's, more important to do the small thing that you know you can get done than it is to do the one thing that you might struggle with. You're, when, when you're building trust with your staff, trust with the people around you, even sometimes trust with yourself, that making that bed is really important because it. I said I, I'd do it, I did it, now I have some trust, uh, building up trust. So I would mm -hmm. say, you know, one of my, my largest problems is I wanna do too many things. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's just about doing doing one thing. And it's maybe not that one thing. Maybe it's not the biggest thing. Maybe it's the thing that I know that I can accomplish that's going to show everybody else, hey, we can move forward. Uh, it's kind of a leadership one thing. Let me just throw this challenge at you. You've got a to-do list that's sitting in front of you and you start. And, and it doesn't matter if it's your it's the frog that you're starting with, but you're starting with something. And then you digress and then you something pings the phone something happens with the phone you feel you have to check email and you start putting yourself in a very very vicious cycle how do we overcome that you have to create habit we're creatures of habit and so you need to create some time uh, you don't create time you set aside time and uh you know i i recommend that if you're you're going to be a leader manager consultant that you spend 20 to 30 minutes uh in the morning uh, in planning. Uh, I've got my list in front of me. Uh, I review my list throughout the day, but in the morning, I, I don't have my cell phone on. I don't have my email open. I don't have my door open. Uh, things exactly. So that I can, I can kind of plan my day. And, and my day changes all day long and it changes every other day. I mean, every morning when I, I wake up and I go back in, I look at my list, something that I thought was of the utmost dire importance is no longer the thing that's of the utmost dire importance. It's it moves down on the list, and something else goes above that. Yeah. Uh, and also oh. having so, Carm, two two things for me. One, pick something or some things, and and let other things go. The things that aren't going to get you what you want. The things that are, you know. And then number two, the habit of planning daily, with yeah. nothing else in my way. There's a concept that I learned reading a book. It was called The Compound Effect by Darren Hardy. Excellent book. And he talks about this concept of bookending your days. And what he says is, and I, tro I totally agree with it, is there's only two times in your day that you can completely control. And that is the beginning of your day and the end of your day.
And I think it's really important to start our days with intention, right? I have right here, it looks like a Bible here, but this is actually my daily planner. I have a daily planner. I sit down at 5.30 in the morning and I write out and I plan my day. I visualize my day. And then at the end of the day, when I'm bookending, I think that's a time for reflection. How did I do today? What did I do well? What can I do better? And then in between, there's a whole lot of action. But I think that the, the thing about it is to be intentional and understand the outcomes that you want to achieve and what's the one or two things I can do to move closer to that outcome. I uh, learned something le recently that really <laughs> helped personally because I was getting overwhelmed with lists and overwhelmed with to do's and multiple sources of information and data coming out. And uh, uh, somebody gave me a suggestion to me is uh, rather than just follow a list, I make appointments to get things done. Mm -hmm. So I've just switched to a digital planner so I can't show it to the group there, Rick. So I've got a, my, my Mac, my Mac planner there. It's all different color coded. Uh, it didn't take very long to set up and I have appointments for this and appointments for that. And they're not appointments with anybody except for me on that project. And uh, like Cecil said, the first part of the day, is everything's off, thinking about the day. I haven't done the book ending at the end, so I'm gonna grab that one, but um, make appointments for the tasks that you wanna do. Um, yes. Because I would never disrespect, so if I had an appointment with Cecil to discuss something, I wouldn't just not show up, right? I would respect him or let him know that I couldn't make it. Why not make an appointment with that thing that I have to get done, right? That PowerPoint that has to be finished, right? And that's excellent, because when I'm talking to clients, one of the things I talk to them, and let's face it, there's, no, there's very few shop owners that are 100% owners. They are technicians or they're advisors and, and, you know, they're overwhelmed. And one of the things that I teach my clients is I call it schedule your hats. You can't wear more than one hat at a time. Otherwise, you look like a dummy, right? So wear one hat at a time, but schedule blocks of time for each hat every day. And when you start to do that, you really start to get control of your business and can move it forward. If you don't, if you don't set aside time routinely to do the things that are important, the things that are important never get done. Yeah. Uh, and we see that all the time with all the fires and all the problems and all the, you know, uh, uh, the micromanaging that goes on in businesses. Too much time goes by and nothing happens. So many technicians get into it because they're what's called kinesthetic learners. They, they learn by touch, feel, do. They didn't care for sitting in a class, reading and listening. They wanted to do stuff. That's why they became technicians. They want to fix things. They, and that's what they gravitate to. Then they open up a shop and they can't fix it. <laughs> it. You can't just replace a piece like a water pump and make it run well. It's complicated. People, they talk back, customers, right? And so what ends up happening is, as owners, if they're still multitasking with this stuff, tend to gravitate back to the shop and ignore the front stuff, ignore the staff, ignore the customers, because they're comfortable with the back part of it. I had one guy, he also drag races on the weekends. I mean, this guy is kinetic, kinesthetic, ADHD, you name it. He's got the syndrome, right? Love him dearly. And his action plan with me for a whole year was to spend a half an hour in his office with the door lock thinking about his business. Four years later, I met him at a convention, and he spends half of his week in his office now. He got it. I'm so proud of him. His name's Mike. I, I think you also have to look at um, tendencies. And, and I think there are two rather large tendencies that happen, uh, in at least in the clients that I, I look at. One is... When I don't know what to do or how to do the job, my tendency is to find other things to distract me. So uh, I, 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 I even myself, when I got to write an article and it's not coming in, you know, the brain's not working, I'll, uh, I'll start doing something else. And four hours later, I still haven't put one word on the paper. And, and, and what I did might have been important. Maybe I needed to do it at some point in time, but it wasn't more important than the thing that I needed to write. So there's a tendency for us to distract ourselves when there's something that we don't really understand and we don't really know how to do. Okay, your customer's engine or transmission has failed, but now is not the time for them to trade their vehicle. Not without a working engine or transmission. Besides, would they have kept their vehicle another three to five years if their engine or transmission had not let them down? 
Well, if you answered yes, then Jasper Engines and Transmissions is your choice to give your customer's vehicle new life and many thousands of miles of enjoyable driving performance. When considering the high cost of a new or newer used vehicle, there's a pretty good case to be made for your customers to replace a drivetrain component that has failed or is delivering poor performance, rather than trading their car, truck, van, or SUV. Install a quality remanufactured Jasper product for less than your customer would have to invest in a different vehicle. Go to jasperengines.com to learn more about the money-saving value of Jasper. Hey, I'm with RepairPal certified shop owner Matthew Royaye from Auto Check Elite in Katy, Texas. Hey, Matthew. Good morning. How are you? I'm great. RepairPal certified network bringing you in a lot of business. We get a lot of business from them. Yes, I like the people that work there. I was the first certified shop in probably in the whole Texas. I know for sure in Houston area. So I've been with them for a very long time. I use their estimator a lot. Their estimator is on my web page. We don't give estimates over the phone. If they insist that they want an estimate, they can go to our web page. We have a landing page just for estimates. It builds an estimate, and we honor whatever that web page says. There are times that is off fifty bucks, hundred bucks. I don't care the amount of time we save by not just building estimates nonstop. It's very valuable to me. Would you recommend Repair Pail to a friend? Of course, I have. Many, many, many times. To find out more information, go to repairpale.com slash shops. As a side note, Cecil, I, I need to ask you, if, if, if you were having writer's block, for example, or, or any task that you had to do, you said, listen, I got to get this done. I'm just not it's, not, it's not in my zone right now. Music, a, a walk, you know, a walk around the house, a rock, walk around the yard. Will any of that stuff uh, help, you know, the juices to get you going? No, I'll, I'll tell you what, what I had a great writing instructor in, in college. And what the writing instructor said is, uh, if you want to write, write, uh, uh, start writing. It may not be about your subject. It may not be about anything, but start putting some words on paper. And what I find is when I start doing, then all of a sudden uh, the juices flow, things happen. So I might, I might, you know, I might have an article I need to write on, I don't know, on getting stuff done. And, uh, and I, it isn't jiving with me. So I'll, I'll go, you know, I was in a shop the other day and I'll start typing up, you know, that experience. And then pretty soon, you know, I'm flowing into the thing that I need to flow into. So it's, get started. Your parked car. Yeah. Get started. That's, yeah. I'll, I'll tell you the second tendency and maybe there's three. Uh, tendency number two is to be afraid of failure. And by the way, the, the cool thing is if you never start, you never fail. So safe. We, we have a, we have this idea, I think as human beings, and, and I don't think it's uh, certainly the, uh, uh, limited to the automotive industry that, you know, I'm a little afraid that if I do this and I don't succeed, that I'm going to look bad or feel bad or that I'm a failure or whatever that is. I cannot tell you how many times I've failed, Carm. Uh, I couldn't count them. Uh, 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 they number in the millions. You have to get used to failing and, and, and accepting that as a part of your success and a, as a part of your moving forward. Not everything you do is going to be perfect. And in fact, there's that, that blockage that we have every once in a while that whatever we do, it has to be perfect. And you'll never, and then you never get started. You've got to suck before you get to great. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's totally true. And, you know, I think the problem we have on that subject is I think we're misnaming things. We got to look at our businesses like a giant lab, like a big science experiment. And all we're getting back are results. They're either desired results or unexpected results. And all we're there to do is learn from them. Failure is when you give up. Failure is when, I think failure is when you let an event determine what you believe your future potential is. Otherwise, it's just feedback. That's all it how, is. How many That's wings golden. did the how did the how many wings did the Wright brothers have to make till they actually got off the ground? I don't think it was that one first set that we always see in that little video clip, right? I think they no. must have made hundreds of them. I mean, how many of us see kids? We have our little kids and they get up to walk and they fall down and we say, Hey, you're stupid. Don't ever do that again. <laughs> I love that analogy. I always tell my clients, I said, You walked in here today, right? And they're like, Yeah. I says, When did you learn to walk? I don't know. When I was little, do you remember learning? No. I said, how many times do you fall down? 
And they, then all of a sudden we start laughing. And they realize that they must have fallen down a thousand, two thousand, three thousand times before they could walk. I said, unless the child is born with some kind of a serious disability, we always want to get better. But something happens in our society that it bangs it out of us, like school or something, right? It bangs it out of us. We need to learn to be kind to ourselves and give yes. ourselves a chance. You know, I have people that they have people that they, they want to be confident before they start something. And the issue with that is confidence doesn't come first. First comes the choice. Then comes the commitment. Then comes the courage to do it. Then come competency. Then comes confidence. That's the way it works. And you've got to have the courage to go and realize, I'm going to learn. I'm going to get better. It's the story we tell ourselves. Yeah. yeah that's excellent, guys. So, guys, I've been coaching for 14 years now. Um, and of course, my passion is, is is how to help myself change, but how to help other people change. And I ran across a saying, and I, I I have the name of the author somewhere. I couldn't find it this morning, but and he said, you cannot plan results. You can only plan actions. I think his first name was Paul. I don't remember his last name. I can't find anything else by the guy except this one statement. And I realized that so much of goal setting, forecasting, budgeting, planning is we plan results and we talk about results, we talk about the goals, but we don't leave with any action. So uh, I experimented with this a few years ago, and I'm kind of fine-tuning it into a process I call SOAR coaching. S stands for situation, O for outcome, A for action, and R for result. So somebody in the class is saying, you know, I'm at 2.4 sold hours per RO, and uh, I can't seem to make the dial move on that. And we agree in the room that unless they get another advisor, they're not going to move the dial because their action plan was to improve that number. Well, what a ridiculous action plan. You know how many things changed that gentleman? I mean, you guys know that, right? So then they agreed that they needed a higher service advisor. Three months went by and nobody was hired. And it's kind of like I looked at these folks and I said, you committed to this. What's the problem? Well, you know, we're scared of who we're going to get. Will they fit in the shop culture? And will, you know, all this other kind of stuff. So I, I experimented with them with the sarcasm. I said, what's the situation? Well, the situation is, is that we need a service advisor. Point blank, no emotions. This is the reality. Mm -hmm. What's the outcome that you would like? Well, we would like a, this person, these qualities, these traits, these abilities, da, 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 da. This is what you would like. So you graphically you write down what you like. I said, what's the first action you have to take to get that? Well, I guess we have to write up this description of what we just described. So over the next three months, they wrote up the positional contract. They then created advertisements. They then ran the ads. And then on the third month, they hired somebody. So the idea is, is to break it. We talk about breaking things down into chunks. But the idea is, is we plan not to hire a service advisor. I plan on writing the job description. And then I plan on writing the ad to attract the right one. And then I plan on posting the ad. And then your brain rewards yourself for doing it. And next thing you know, these people had a fantastic service advisor. They now have a third service advisor and they're building a brand new shop because they've learned this principle. I am so excited about this soar thing. Soaring with the Thank eagles. You guys have heard that stuff, right? Ken Blanchard. <laughs> Absolutely. There, there's, there's so much talking that goes on in companies about what they would like and what they want. And I think, um, I, I think even goal setting, but then it stops. Mm -hmm. There has to be action. Somebody has to sit down. So in, I have a management uh, uh, cycle that I've created or I've, I've, I've recognized and I've written down. Uh, first is goals. What do we want? What's the outcome we want? Uh, uh, next, we got to talk with the people that are going to have to do the work, get their agreement that it's a reasonable goal. After that, we have to strategize. Um, uh, how are we going to do? Who, when is this going to happen? Who's going to do it? How is it going to be done? Or how do we think it's going to be done? That ought to be, that's probably more accurate. Uh, and, and we have to have a way to measure uh, what's the result. You know, uh, uh, how do we know if we hired a service advisor? Well, guess what? Here's a body here. There's a measurement, a, a way to see that the job was done. Somebody has to go act. Um, and then last but not least, there has to be follow-up. Uh, is it the right body? Is it, uh, did it work the way that it was supposed to? Uh, where are the consequence? What are the consequences, either positive or negative for the, for the employer, for the team, or, or for the individual? Um, if you follow a process, you're much more likely to get the job done, and you're much more likely to get the job done correctly. And I don't care what the acronyms are, but, but somebody has to go do the action. You can talk all you want. And, uh, and uh, you can say whatever you want to say, 
But if you don't, if somebody doesn't go do the work, um, I'll, I'll, I'll add one more comment. And that is in the, when you have meetings with anybody, if I have a meeting one-on-one -on -one with uh, one of my people, one of my staff members, or one-on-one -on -one with one of my clients, or uh, with my whole team, we strategize and we come up with a task. Uh, 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 someone is going to do something. And, and there's a deadline in that. We never walk away without the task and the deadline. Um, when we have a task and a deadline, now we can follow up uh, uh, at, at our next meeting or at two meetings down the road. Without that, you can't follow up. Cecil, you're the accountability coach, or at least the person who is asking, getting a commitment. Uh, think of the shop owner who doesn't have a business coach and who is floundering. That's self-discipline. I mean, you realize your role as the CEO of your company and, and, and the things you have to do to move your business forward. But so many of our shop owners that don't have that discipline today. I mean, I think that's who we're trying to talk to and help help rise all ships with that. How did I get there? Right. I mean, I, I was a, I was a shop owner, um, just like all these other people. Yeah. I was struggling uh, 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 being successful. Mm -hmm. um, how did I get there? I, I guess for me, I recognized that I needed help. So I hired Jim Hunt. Um, I hired uh, uh, Bob O'Connor. Yeah. Um, I, I hired uh, uh, Mike Lee uh, and I went, I went to their stuff and I learned stuff. And you know what else I did? I went online and I got a bunch of self-help books, uh, organizational books, books, uh, uh, the one thing, you know, all, all of those books. And I read those things. I read, huh? I don't know how many books I've read on, on just on trying to stay focused on trying to stay structured and, and then I recognized, I sat down and I spent some time with myself, uh, uh, recognizing my, my faults, my tendencies that were not good tendencies. And I decided I'm going to change them. And I made small changes, got some uh, trust built with myself. And then I made bigger changes. And then I fell on my face a couple of times and picked myself up and, and kept moving forward. Um, I think you're, I think you're, what you're saying right now is, you ought to have a coach, uh, uh, a period. I mean, and I like that. That's a great thing to say because uh, that's what all four of us do for a living. Please don't think that that's my focus, but that's what I've learned being a aftermarket podcaster for over 400 episodes on Remarkable Results and 100 on the Town Hall Academy is that the most successful shop owners out there have made the decision to get help. And, and, and again, it could be reading books, it could be attending seminars, it could be listening to the podcast, but ultimately at the end of the day, I get cards and letters that say, thank you for motivating me to get, get help from a, from, from a consultant or a business coach perspective. Well, I actually have a coach myself for the last 18 months. I thought, why not, right? Um, and I also wanted to ask Jude a question. Jude, you mentioned something in an email that we were going bantering about, uh, about a book called Getting Things Done. David Allen, you want to chat with the, the group a little bit about that? I think that's a fantastic book. No, I think that was you, right? Yeah, no. I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, it's a, a, a book that uh, gave me great perspective on um, how to go about structuring all this stuff. When you have that whole list of things that you need to get done, um, you know, and, you know, I, I'm, st I'm still mulling over what Cecil just saying. Uh, oh, sorry. Okay. No, it's okay. It's all processing together. It's kind of like, you know, like mashed potatoes. You get some lumps in there and it's good stuff. But, um, uh, yeah, man, when accountability, it's like if, if, is there another way other than a coach? I mean, honestly, do you guys know of another way? Cause if you if we do, we could tell everybody and they could go do that. Well, I think, I think, I think there, is there another way? Probably not, but, but a coach doesn't have to be somebody that you, Hire and pay. I mean, your your mm -hmm. spouse, your significant other. Right. It comes uh, in lots of forms. Sharing sharing your goals and your targets with your staff. Your staff can hold you accountable, uh, mm -hmm. but there has to be accountability. And I think we miss that so often in our in our businesses and with even with our people. And and what happens is we have these long term employees that have been with us for a very long time. They're out of control. They don't do what we want anymore. Um, but we don't want to fire them because ah, oh, they were here in the beginning. Uh, and, yeah. and we ruined them because we didn't coach them, because we didn't hold them accountable. Uh, we didn't set the goals. We didn't strategize with them. 
We didn't store with them. And, uh, and, and it's, it's unfortunate because if we did it better, we'd hold on to more employees longer and better. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Good, good. Okay. I'll, I'll jump back in. Thanks. I just had to finish that thought because it was yeah. just right there. So um, yeah, David Allen, getting things done. It's, it's a great uh, philosophy on how to handle our, our brains were never designed to store lists of information. They just don't. And if anybody is doing that, I can guarantee you it's wearing you out. Um, if you're just constantly in the back of your mind going, wait, I got to get this done. I got to get that done. I got to get this done. I got to get that. Oh, and that. I can't forget this. And I can't forget that. And usually you get maybe a small percentage of it done. And the rest of it, at least if you're like me, the rest of it floats off in outer space somewhere. And then somebody says, well, what about that? And you're like, oh, I forgot to write that down. So anyway, his philosophy is you take everything as it comes in. The second that it comes into your mind of, I need to get that done. And you put it down on a main list. And then you break it down into, into various subsections. And um, it, it works really well, uh, but you, you need to do it how you're going to do it. Some people need to do it on a piece of paper, handwritten, and I'm okay with that. If that's your thing, then just – it's more important that you do it than how you do it. Um, I personally use a program, uh, speaking to the technology point that I was talking about, that was designed around that philosophy. It's called Wonderlist. W-U-N-D-E-R-L-A-S-T, and it breaks everything down. There's what they call the inbox. And so as you have a thought, you have it on your phone, your computer, it syncs to everything. You can share it, blah, blah, It's a great program, um, and it's free. But you just you, every time you have a thought of something needs to get done, you dump it into your inbox. And then uh, at least once a day, you have to go through and you sort all the stuff in your inbox, and you put it where it needs to go. That needs to go with here. You put dates on it. You put uh, due dates. You put reminders, all that kind of stuff. Because, of course, if you don't put a date on it, then who cares? It just floats out there in cyberspace somewhere. So you organize all of your things. And the idea is how he originally did it before, because uh, he wrote his first version of the book way before computers were uh, able to handle a lot of this in a user-friendly way. And so he literally had 365 file folders, one for every day of the year. And when he got a task and he would go through his inbox of all the things that need to get done, he'd pull his inbox out and he'd go, okay, this one needs to be done on July 1st. And he'd go through and he'd stick it in July 1st. And then he'd go, okay, this one needs to be done on you know, April 2nd. And he'd put it in April 2nd. And he would keep doing that until he was all the way through his inbox. And then each day he pulls out. Now it's on April 2nd. He pulls out his April 2nd file and he opens it. And there's all the things that he needs to get done that day. Um, and so it was just a great way to, to uh, task organize when you have uh, a constant flow of things that need to be getting done. Uh, over and over and over and over again, and it keeps filling up. So that's kind of a real quick overview of what his concept is. Of course, there's a lot more in it if you if you read the book and and it explains it in more detail. When I was looking at, and I haven't read um, Dave Allen's book, but when I looked at the overview of it, because I knew I had to get the book and we were going to talk about it today, he says something that we lack bandwidth for creative thinking, and that really hit me hard. Some people have that gift and some don't. And if, you know, Cecil, you were saying, and we know CEO needs to set the vision of the company and be creative and be able to take things from the outside world and make it theirs. You know, we have to actually realize that some people just don't have that innate ability. I, I don't know that I, I don't know that I agree with that, frankly. Okay. Um, I'm not a creative person. Uh, never been a creative person in my entire life. Um, I do occasionally get a crazy idea. <laughs> um, Danger zone. Uh, the 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 difference I think is that in the planning, um, I take time to be with me. Um, I create habits about thinking about my company and what would be a great product. And occasionally somebody upsets me, and I come up with something uh, in response. Uh, uh, I'm probably more uh, reactive than proactive, but. Um, I look like I'm a really creative guy, but I'm not. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm regurgitating uh, ideas and thoughts and, and stuff that I've heard and I've learned from other uh, great coaches and consultants that I've learned over the years. Here's, the, here, here's the, the probably the biggest problem in an automotive shop for uh, the owner. They're trying to do too much. They become the answer man. That everything goes through them, and 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 if I'm spending you know uh, 11 hours a day in my shop, 
problem solving for everybody else. I don't no. get the chance or the time to sit down and be problem solving for me or my company. Yeah, and, yeah. and so what we have to do, I think, as coaches and consultants, our responsibility is we have to teach these guys how to better manage their business so that they can better manage their time and have the chance and the opportunity to think and, and have the freedom to think in a creative way about their company and about what they would like out of their lives. And I don't, I don't know that that happens very often for a typical business owner in a small business. If I can touch on that point really quick, because I, I think that um, what David Allen is, is actually talking about is exactly what Cecil just said, is that some people have more or less bandwidth, if you will, for creativity. Everybody has some. Um, but the problem is, is when I was talking about when you, when you're storing, you're using up all your bandwidth, keeping the list in your head of all the things you need to get done. And if you can get that out of your head and on paper, which is where it needs to be anyway, or on your digital device or whatever it is to have a chance at really getting it done is where it needs to be, you know, with a deadline on and all that kind of stuff, then that frees up the bandwidth in your head to be able to be creative. And that's what Cecil's saying is, is you have to, if, if you don't, if it doesn't come natural to you, which it doesn't to a lot of people, you have to force yourself to have that time, set it aside. And in the beginning, it's going to be uncomfortable and you know, painful, whatever, but eventually it's going to pay off and it's going to become like one of your favorite things. You're like, Oh man, I can't wait for my hour this morning or half hour or whatever your time slot is. Well, if, if I can, um, Oh, you can. Thank you. I appreciate that. You will. I will anyway. <laughs> um, I think we got to be careful with the words we use. And I, I'm big on words. You know, if you talk to a shop owner, the basic, uh, not a basic, but the, the majority of shop owners, if you start talking to them about a vision, their eyes glass over and their head fogs up and they start, their head starts spinning. But if you say, hey, what's the destination? Where are we going? That has more impact. Instead of calling it created creativity or being creative, why don't we call it dreaming? What's the dream? Where are we going? We don't give ourselves time. Like Cecil said, we're so busy. They're so busy. They don't give themselves time to get to know themselves, to get to know where they want to go and, 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 and why they want to do it. You know, and, 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 you know, this is about implementing and, and, you know, we got to step back and say, what am, why am I implementing something? What's driving this implementation? Is it, is it proactive or is it reactive? See, if it's reactive, I got to under, and the reason why I want to know that is because if I'm going to come into and start implementing something, I have to understand the baggage that I'm bringing to it. If I'm reactive, there's more likely, it's more likely to be charged with a lot of emotion uh, from loss or feeling less or, or, or losing out on something. I've got to be aware of that energy. Um, if it's proactive, I, you know, there's a different kind of energy. It's exciting. It's growth. It's, it's something that I want to do. So we've got to be aware of that first. And then we got to know why. Why am I doing this? What's the outcome that I want? And we got to know why, because the implementation, the, the, the sitting down and thinking about it, that's kind of fun. But then like Cecil says, we got to go in and do stuff every day to get it there. That gets boring. We got to remember why we're doing it so that we keep on doing it. And a great question to ask yourself is, number one, why do I want this? And make it really emotional, really dig in and figure out why. And then what happens if it stays the same? It's kind of the carrot and the stick, right? Why do I want it? That's my carrot. And then what happens if I stay the same? That's the stick, right? And that really works out well. I think it's really important to understand what's motivating your change. I think Bob O'Connor used to say, uh, nobody changes until it hurts bad enough. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I think it was him that I would attribute that to. <laughs> I remember the pain that he would put us through uh, when I had my place. Uh, something else I wanted to bring up in this is something that's called transferability. And uh, those of you that are technicians listening, you know, it drives you crazy when you hire a technician that worked at a Honda dealership and you put him in a Ford and he can't work on a Ford. It's like, it still has four wheels. It still has injectors. It's still, so that's transferability. Transferring, yeah, it's got a different nameplate on it, but it's still, you know, internal combustion engine. And it's the same with this stuff. What I have found working with, uh, with shop owners, again, most of them being <clears throat> from technician backgrounds is once you show them that they can transfer their knowledge, because a lot of us coming up this trade, 
did not feel smart in school, right? I mean, we were we were the dumb kids. We were the ones that got put into occupational class, right? So there's a stigma affiliated. Even in 2019, I think in the back of some of us older guys' minds, there's a stigma attached with being a mechanic. And my, I have had some great fun with some some owners where I've shown them that if they can diagnose a 2017 drivability, reprogram it, flash it, and which I don't even have a clue what, are you, what I'm even talking about when I'm saying this, and they can do all of that. I said, we just have to figure out how to transfer that knowledge, that ability to the business. And as soon as we could connect those dots of horsepower, of of, inter, you know, of friction and things like that to a business and make pictures that make their, like you said, that all of a sudden they click, right? They begin to transfer the skill because they're smart. These are smart people, oh, yeah. right? And I just love it when the dots connect and they're able to transfer that knowledge to running a business uh, the way they, uh, you know, the way they run a vehicle, getting the horsepower out of it. To me, it, it's so simple in the sense that when I was a tech, I, I, I looked at the way the car ran. I tracked it down to a system, a problem I thought it had. I put a component in place or I made an adjustment and then I saw how the way the car ran. And, and I think it's that easy, you know, when you understand the numbers of your business, you got to learn that. I mean, and now you can look at your business and, and go, Oh, wow. I know this problem because it, my scanner tells me I have a problem with average exactly. order. Scanner, and, yes. uh, and, yes. uh, and now I'm going to, you know, what are the potential fixes? Well, I could hire another service advisor. I could do better inspections. I can, I can have a better salesperson that closes on more stuff. I mean, and, and, and okay, let's try one of those. Let's put it in place and, 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 and let's measure and see what happened. Oh, that was wonderful. Now, how do we get the rest? I mean, you, you start to have real progress when you, when you, when you really start to understand. And this, this stigma thing, I got to talk about it for just a second. I am so... If you are, in, if you're running a small business, an automotive business, and I don't care if you're super successful, partially successful, not as successful as you want to be, and you're fixing cars today, you're as smarter, smarter than any doctor that ever came out of any medical school. Stop Amen. being stigmatized because somebody at some point in your life said you're not that smart or you're not that you couldn't, you, you don't sit still. So let's put you in automotive. Um, <laughs> these guys. The, the, the tools, and I, and I don't mean just the stuff they buy and invest in. I mean the brain power that it takes. The, 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 it's amazing what it's techniques. Intuitive. And, it's intuitive. You watch them. They're magicians. Oh, they're they're magicians. Absolutely. Yeah. Even, even more than magicians. They're, I, I don't know. Yeah. They're, they're, they're whatever they are. They're just, they're geniuses, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and yet they think they don't deserve success because they're yeah. not as smart as the, the doctor, the lawyer down the street. Well, that's, excuse me, that's just bull. We got to get our head out of our behinds yeah. and start to understand how valuable we are and how smart we are as an industry and, uh, and, and, and move forward. As an Preach your brother, Cecil. Absolutely. Amen. Absolutely. And, and yeah. guess what? And guess what? For those of you that are out there listening today or later on, and you're feeling like you're not as successful as you should be, I'm telling you now, none of us, including everybody on this panel, is as successful as they want to be. I success agree. is never a destination. It's always a journey. I am more successful today than I've ever been, and I'm still not where I want to be. And that's the way we're designed. We're designed to grow. And, and so please don't feel like you're less than, like Cecil's been saying. Don't let somebody else, where somebody else is at, di dictate what you believe you, is possible for you. It just means they're a little further along. That's all. How can I be better tomorrow? Amen. That's all I want to know, right? Amen. Give me something that will help me be step better every day. Nothing like having this panel together, this incredible, <laughs> to go places we never expect that they would go. <laughs> I love it. But you know what, Carmen? This, this is really an important aspect of this because if I'm afraid of failure, if I don't set time aside, if I'm, if I'm afraid I can't be successful, I'm less likely to implement and try. Amen. Okay. I'm going to implement. Yeah. I'm going to fail. I'm going to fail a lot. But the good news is I always talk about dating here uh, and, and I'm married, so I'm not dating. And, but let's assume that maybe my wife dumped me because I'm just not much of a catch now. And uh, and I'm going to be a single guy and I'm going to go ask one woman out. What are the odds that I'm going to have a date if I ask one woman out tonight? I'm not getting a date. OK, I'm fat. Uh, my hair's receding. You know, I got white hair. We can see uh, all that. You know, right. Cecil, Cecil <laughs> just show her your check, just show her your checkbook, Cecil. Yeah. 
Well, that might be a problem too. I've uh, recently invested in a couple of things. Um, but, but, but Carm, what if I ask a hundred women out? Okay. Uh, I'm going to get a lot of no's. I'm going to hear a lot of no's, but you know what? There's going to be 15, 16 blind, dumb women that are going to say yes. Absolutely. Yep. Um, and that's, that's business. That's life. I'm going to try things. I'm going to, I'm going to fail. And then I'm going to go, well, can't do it that way. What's the next dumb idea that I got? And, and I'm going to go try again and I'm going to try again and I'm going to try again. And eventually I will succeed. Yes. Great okay. advice. I want to get ready to sum this thing up. This has been great. It, it always is every time we get together with you guys. Uh, my books page on the website has Dave Allen's book, Getting Things Done. We also have the one thing up there from, uh, from Gary Keller. Guys, I want to sum it up this way. Tell us about any recent implementation challenge you've had recently. I'll start. I'll yeah. start. We have an online advisor academy. Never done anything like it before. It's a 26-week program um, and not over 90 videos. Um, and we did it, and we it's great stuff, and we're completely scrapping it and doing it over. Wow. Next. Mine, mine's a little bit different. Um, my company is brand new. I'm only six months old uh, in my new company. Um, my groups have formed. I'm so grateful for my, my clients uh, in my coaching groups. And now I've launched my three-day smart course. And I'm doing marketing, and it's filling up little by little. And I'm terrified it's not going to fill up enough. So, guys, what I do this morning after this, after this session I'm doing my marketing and I'm doing all the pieces I have control over because I think all of you have heard me say this before. You do what you have control over so that you can deal with the things you don't have control over. So I'm going to go right to my uh, uh, coffee with my wife because I just got home last night and we're, then I'm going to get to my marketing of my, my stuff and I know it will fill up because I know people who know me will send their people to me. So, But guys, I, I got some fear going on here right now, so I'll be honest with you, but I know that the marketing works. So. I um I'm not going to say what we're doing but we're announcing we're going to be announcing something new in in June that we'll be implementing in July. Um another one of Cecil's crazy ideas. Cool. Pull my staff together uh in December and I sat down with my staff and I said, "Okay, coming up in 2019, uh we're going to continue our service mastery. We're changing our shop mastery and we have this new thing that we're going to do and I want a date of July." And my staff spent the next 30 minutes telling me all the reasons we couldn't do it. Okay. Uh, uh, we don't have enough time. We don't have enough money. We don't have enough staff. We don't have enough of this. We don't have enough of that. And uh, after we, they got all done at, at the end of 30 minutes, I said, okay, I've heard all the reasons that we can't get the job done. Now I want a plan to get the job done. Okay. <laughs> and we now have a plan. Now, by the way, it, we may not make it in July. It may be August. It might even be September, but it won't push past that because we have a plan uh, because I wouldn't allow them to tell me all the reasons why we couldn't get it done. Uh, too many people are focused on all the reasons they can't. You want to be successful in the world. You want to be successful in business. Uh, as, as Murray said, focus on the things that you have control over. Get yourself a plan together. It isn't all going to work perfectly. I guarantee it. But um you know, I've fallen on my face more than once. I'll do it again uh, tomorrow and I'll pick myself up and, and turn around and make whatever the change is that I need to make to be successful. Absolutely. I, I never ask any of my clients to do anything that I can't and I'm not willing to try myself. Amen. So, For me right now, uh, it's actually more about uh, the shop because uh, since I took over full ownership of it and uh, well, technically I started a new company basically in July. And um, so a lot of my shift, my focus has been on that and less on the consulting side of things. Um, I'm still doing all of that. It's just it, the shop is taking the bulk of my time right now. I'm thinking of uh, actually, I think it was Murray that said it, um, talking about a client that was saying, man, I want four hours for repair order. I'm stuck at 2.4. I need that second advisor. And I've been telling my uh, people for a little bit now that as soon as we get to X, Y, Z, we're bringing on that second advisor. And so I'm feeling uh, challenged, like I've been dragging this out too long and I need to just 
make that leap, you know, cause I'm of course looking at all the numbers and waiting for them to all line up just right before I, <laughs> you know, hit the go button kind of thing. But, um, perfect. But anyway. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I love it, but it's uh, it'll kill you. So Nothing. June, there's, there's three other coaches staring at your video on our screens going, yeah. just do it, buddy. Yeah. Just do it. <laughs> it, 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 it. The, 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 the stars, the stars never align perfectly. Exactly. Yeah, I know. That's, that's, that's the thing is, I, I know all this stuff. I tell everybody those things. But then you're you're sitting in the middle of it. Darn it for being a human. You know what I mean? Yeah, I hate it. Uh, <laughs> one of the one of the classic uh, blunders, uh, besides uh, in a, being in a land war in Asia, yeah, uh, uh, is uh, um, is waiting for the stars to align before you do what you you need to do. Yeah, that comment from the Princess Bride. If you haven't seen that movie, go see that movie. It's great. Inconceivable. Yes, yeah, inconceivable. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. I had a great lesson about being single, which I hope I never happens to me. But <laughs> yes. Thank you, Cecil. Great wise words from a great wise man. Uh, Business Coaches Lab, uh, episode 104, The Art of Implementation, How to Get Things Done. Oh, you know, by the way, today was the 400th episode of the Remarkable Results Radio Podcast. Oh, congratulations, and it, Carl. And it, hey, yes, hey. thank you. And it went out today. And it was all about listen to learn just one thing and what it means to the, the panel that I had on for the 400th. It's a long episode, but well worth your listen. Guys, thanks for your continued support. We'll see you back next quarter. Thanks for being on board to listen and learn from the premier automotive aftermarket podcast. Until next time.